So over the last 50 years, we've had a 73% decline in the relative abundance of uh, species populations. Fresh water, and, and so that index is for species that occur on land, in oceans, and in freshwater systems. It's freshwater systems in particular where the decline is even worse. So these are, this is the global index that we're talking about here. It may vary from place to place. Um, Africa follows largely uh, as a continent the global uh, statistics, but there's uh, um, been a, an 85% decline in the relative abundance of freshwater species. And between these three biomes, oceans, land, and, and freshwater, if we look at the dominant drivers of change within the continent of Africa, just to bring it a little bit closer to home, we see that hab habitat loss and degradation, and that is, of course, largely driven by, by our food systems, um, not exclusively, but food and, and, and deforestation, etc., uh, drives a lot of the, the decline. So these are the dominant drivers. Uh, the second biggest dominant driver is over-exploitation of species, and here mammals and fish feature quite strongly. But the perversity here is that people are going to bed hungry in parts of the world where in other parts we're wasting food to a significant extent. In South Africa, one in five people, one in five people go to bed hungry at least once a week. Global food systems currently are responsible for over a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions, drawing more than 70% of fresh water globally, and in South Africa it's close to 70%, I believe, to produce our food. This is not suggesting that we stop producing food and saving water, obviously, but we've got to combine the two and, and do a bit better. And most species that are at risk of extinction is threatened by our food system. We have to scale up our nature positive production practices so that we can deliver food for everyone. This is regenerative farming, conservation farming, climate smart agriculture, agroecology, name it what you want. But it's a far more clever way of producing food in partnership with nature, not extracting from it. Then those issues, the perverse issues around our food system has to be addressed. And of course we've got to uh, remove um, environmentally harmful subsidies for practices, agricultural practices, that we can no longer justify. People are not an afterthought in all of this. For all of these recommendations and activities to endure, all solutions will have to be inclusive, just, equitable, and grounded in human rights. Now, that's not just uh, simple speak. This is some of the most difficult stuff for us to achieve. But WWF and other environmental organizations are determined that people and nature together uh, will thrive. There is urgency. We all have to come together and do something that's radically different. The statistics are simply telling us that we just cannot keep drawing. We've got to put something back. We need to find a conservation approach that literally means living with. And it deliberately means moving away from what we've done in the last hundred years to a point where we can accept that we operate in a living landscape. And that national parks cannot continue to be an island in a sea of poverty. It cannot be like that. So we came to a point where we deliberately decided to change the way we're going to do things. And we then called it Vision 2040, to the point that a few uh, days ago, we made a public statement, we made a public commitment to the public of Vision 2040. There's a theme where we say that Vision 2040 is all about living in harmony with nature. And I'll get to mega living landscapes now. So it's about living in harmony with nature where people and nature is able to thrive. So it is a collective convergence 
of not just the environment, but also the social well-being of people. And remember, yes, we say people. Note, I didn't say a particular sector of society. Everyone is into that vision of sand parks. And we decided that because of the notion of having a national park in a, as an island in the sea of poverty, we ask ourselves, so what is this vehicle through which we're going to implement this vision? And we adopted mega living landscapes. It will be done in a way where we move from the traditional fenced off conservation areas to create spaces that support biodiversity but also local community well-being. It will also realize socioeconomic benefits from conservation and biodiversity by creating economic opportunities and improve the quality of life for all South Africans. And the third one is all about inclusivity, it's all about partnerships. Sandbox cannot achieve this in isolation, and secondly, it cannot achieve that without partners. Partners in, in local communities, partners with the private sector, partners with government, but also partners um, with stakeholders as well as uh, uh, NGOs. And it's very important that you use those relationships and partnerships to achieve the, the, the goals of Vision 2040. So the goal of having a mega living landscape is to achieve ecological sustainability whilst also providing significant social and economic benefits by boosting rural economics uh, within uh, society. Sand Parks is taking on and made a public commitment for a, an ambitious goal. And the relationship that we've experienced with WWF in the past couple of years is, will be a, a, a foundation for a lot of the aspects of implementation of Vision 2040, specifically in the mega living landscapes. It's not just about our efforts around biodiversity, but it's also creating durable financing solutions that will underpin the efforts that we have in these mega living landscapes. And I really appreciate from Sandpark's point of view being invited to share with you this ambition, but also to invite you to become a partner with Sandpark's, with WWF, in fulfilling this vision that we want to achieve in this country. So that ultimately we can definitely make a change in people's lives using biodiversity as the foundation to create and make those changes. What I want to draw your attention to is this big gray bar on the left-hand side. And these are nature negative investments. So that's about seven trillion US dollars that are going into nature negative uh, investments. About 1.7 trillion is in, in subsidies. So it's about repurposing subsidies to do things that are in the well-being of, of, uh, of humanity and in our well-being. And this is, gives you an idea of, hypothetically, how you could do that, how you could close that gap. Repurposing some of the negative uh, investments, agricultural, forestry, fishery subsidies, but then also building uh, th new mechanisms, biodiversity offsets mechanisms, uh, investing in natural infrastructure, uh, um, fiscal reform, et cetera, et cetera. So building from both sides, we are able to close this financial gap. So we need to think at different scales if we're wanting to bend the curve. And I think that's a central message that I, I, I want, to, uh, want to talk to you about today, is that we can bend the curve in biodiversity loss. We can bend the curve in the, in the Living Planet Index, but it requires us to think at completely different scales and to not be scared of reinventing and reimagining ourselves. I think we have the tools and mechanisms in place that we didn't have uh, five and 10 years ago. We have a sand park that's thinking completely different. We have financial mechanisms at completely different scales. So, I'm certainly hopeful that we can uh, bend this curve uh, uh, paths and that we can raise the resources to, to get after it in, in, in a proper way.